Appreciate the expression uh, of concern on my health. Uh, somebody, when they first heard me this morning, said that I still don't uh, sound normal. But then uh, I wouldn't say that because somebody would be smart aleck enough to say you've never been normal. But you know, I, I had one of those things that if you stay home and take care of yourself and take medication and sleep and all of that, it lasts about a week. And if you don't do any of that stuff, it lasts about seven days. So my week is about up. <laughs> but I do appreciate the expressions of concern. I appreciate Brother Crow uh, knowing that he offered to preach this morning and this afternoon if I wasn't up to it, but uh, hopefully we'll make it through without too much difficulty. There are a lot of things that certainly impress us about the early church. We've noticed uh, before the impressive growth that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. Then uh, a couple of chapters later, we have about 5,000 men. And then later on, it just says more were added to the church. And so there was a very rapid growth. There was, uh, when you're dealing with the members themselves, we see people that were zealous toward God. They were courageous. Uh, willing to suffer greatly. And in relationship to that cur courage, they were very loyal to their master. But they also maintained a strict adherence to the apostles' doctrine. But then also, one of the traits that we've been looking at specifically is the fact that they were very generous. They would sell their own goods and give that money to the apostles so, so distribution could be made among all brethren. And we began looking at what would cause them to be such dedicated givers uh, during the early church period. And the very first thing that we noted last week was the fact that they gave themselves, 2 Corinthians the 8th chapter and verse 5. They first gave themselves to the Lord. They were truly converted to Christ. Uh, well, and in that conversion, they were not satisfied to be what we many times refer to as simply nominal Christians. They weren't just joining a social club. They weren't just joining as a matter of convenience because that's what other people are doing. They were people of conviction and convert, con, uh, courage. They truly gave of their time, their energy. They gave their capabilities their possessions, and even their life to the cause of Christ. A second reason is, that they, is because of their background. They had a background uh, that was conducive to liberality. You go back into the early church, it was basically composed of Jews. Yet their, the Jews' history was one of that of generosity, the tithes and offerings which they gave. Well, many times it's been uh, judged as being over 30% of their income. It wasn't just simply a tithe or tithing. Uh, so their background was conducive to that attitude of giving. Uh, many times we fail in that area because we are so opposed to the tithing being bound in the church today 
and it's wrong to bind that, certainly, that it lends itself more to an aspect of not giving than that of giving. And many times we fail in our teaching of our children so that we are not teaching by example and thus the background that we have is not really conducive to generosity. But a third reason would be that they recognize the principle of stewardship. They recognized that that which they possessed was not their own. All things ultimately belong to God. Genesis first chapter, he is the creator of all things and thus all things belong to him. And those six days of creation that we see and those were 24 hour periods of time in Genesis one. That God created all things during those six days. And thus they do by right of creation they belong to him. As God was dealing or beginning to deal with the Israelite nation, in Exodus 19 and verse 5, he tells them that there's now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. God states to them, yes, you will be a peculiar treasure to me, but you need to realize the entire earth belongs to me. Now then, there's a matter of degrees here. All the earth belongs to God, but they were going to be special in a special way. They were going to be a peculiar treasure to him, belonging only to him. Later on in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter in verse 14, we're told, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is, the, is Jehovah thy God, the earth also, and all that therein is. So here's the heaven, the heaven of heavens, all of it belongs to God. All that is in them belongs to God. Uh, the Jews basically had three heavens, referred to it in that way. There was the first heaven, which is the air in which we breathe, our atmosphere. The second would be the air above that or the outer space is what we would generally refer to it as being where the stars reside. And thus, when he talks about here, the heaven, that's this area, then the heaven of heavens would be where all the stars would be. The third heaven, of course, would be the dwelling place of God himself. And so here's the heaven, all that would be in this atmosphere, all of the stars and moons and all of the celestial beings, as far as that goes. And he says, all of that is mine, God says. The earth also, all that therein is. The psalmist would write in 24th Psalm in verse 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So again, the earth, the fullness of it, every, that's everything that's in it. And they that dwell therein. In other words, all of us, we all belong to God. There's nothing that does not belong to him. Again, the, Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 10th chapter in verse 26, much the same thing, when he says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So again, saying basically what the psalmist had said. Everything belongs to God. 
And then in 1 Corinthians 6 chapter, in verse 19, he brings it down to our own physical bodies. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? And he tells us we've been bought with a price, therefore we are to glorify God. But you're not your own. We belong to God. Even our own lives. And so everything belongs to God. They recognize that principle. And they recognize us that they had the responsibility of taking care of that which belonged to God. And to use it properly. A lot of times you can uh, see individuals in their own life who will take very poor care of their own goods. But if that individual is entrusted with something from someone else, with the charge, basically the idea, take care of this for me, then that individual will take great care and be very detailed in relationship to taking care of that for someone else. Even though those things are his own, he might not take care of it properly. You see that a lot in our society. Of course, some individuals uh, are just the opposite of that. They'll take great care of their own things, but if somebody belongs to someone else, oh, I don't care about it then, I'll just use it and abuse it. But that attitude generally I don't think is as prevalent as I'm going to take extra special care in relationship to this that belongs to someone else. But yet that's the way in which we are with God. Everything belongs to him. Everything that we possess belongs to God. We are to take care of it for him. We are to use it properly. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4th chapter, verses 1 and verse 2, says, Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Stewardship is what we're talking about, and steward had to recognize, and steward basically was a house servant, a house slave, who the master entrusted his goods with that slave. And the slave had the responsibility and the obligation to take care of them properly, make sure that everything was done correctly. He had to protect that which was his owner's. Joseph was a good illustration of that in Potiphar's house. That Potiphar had entrusted everything to Joseph. Joseph's responsibility was to take care of it, be faithful in keeping it for Potiphar. That's the way we are with God's goods. God has entrusted to us those things which belong to him. We are to be found faithful. Now I realize Paul in context of 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 is talking specifically about the word of God. But the principle behind that that Paul is using deals with anything that belongs to God, which everything belongs to him. Therefore, we are to be found faithful in everything that we have in using it properly for God and for the service of God and for the furtherance of his cause. In the olden times, Malachi would charge God, through Malachi, would charge the people, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? He says, In tithes and offerings. When you don't take care of those things properly and give as you should be giving, then you're robbing God. And we're going to have to give an account, and that's what uh, was taking place in Malachi. God was saying, you're going to be held accountable for the way in which you've robbed me because you have not given the way that you should have been giving. 
You should have been using these things for my glory, but you're trying to pass off or pawn off that which you wouldn't do to even your king. Now then, you're going to be held in account for it. Well, so it is with us. We need to recognize we're going to be held in account for the way in which we have used that which God has given unto us. Or that he has entrusted to our care. He has entrusted those things that we have, all of the money that we possess, all of the goods that we have, yea, our own life itself. He has entrusted to our care and we're going to give an account whether or not we have been found faithful in relationship to our stewardship. They recognize that principle. And maybe more so than we do because of the idea of, of the stewardship and that servant attitude or aspect that here was a servant a slave generally who was entrusted with everything of his masters to take care of them properly and we don't have that type of arrangement too much in our society and so maybe we've lost that feeling of stewardship that we need to have they saw it very clearly and distinctly and they felt that responsibility upon each and every one of them as they went about doing the Lord's business. But then a fourth reason that they gave in such a liberal way <clears throat> is because very possibly they lived in the shadow of the cross while we don't. Some individuals that were Christians during that day had been there when Christ was crucified. They had witnessed his death, his crucifixion. They had seen the love of God demonstrated for, uh, for, them, for all individuals, but they saw it there as Christ hung upon the cross. In John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They were there seeing that gift. As much as we might try to get that feeling and see that within our mind's eye, there's always a difference. We call Thomas Doubting Thomas because while the apostles had, other apostles had seen Jesus and they were telling Thomas about it, Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I actually feel him and see him. And Jesus appeared again and Jesus says to him, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now notice what Jesus says in response. John 20 verse 29 in particular. He says unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas came to that faith because he had seen Jesus. There was something that was real about that to Thomas that was not real before. We have that problem though. You know, when... Brother Paul would go over to Russia and he would come back with a report and he would talk about uh, the people over there, Ludmilla, for example. I mentioned her name and it put something in Paul's mind. But to us who've never met her, you know, it's a name. He can try and 
his very best to tell us about her and all of the things about her, but it's still a, a faceless being to us. could talk about the individuals and the translators and uh, Ilya and all of those, uh, Roma and you know, now then that I've been over there, those individuals, when he mentions those names or I mention those names, they mean something to me. There's a difference between having gone over there and actually seeing those individuals and the pictures that were brought back and just seeing those pictures and you know we have out here on the bulletin board the three men that we help support and we have pictures of those men but let's face it none of us have ever met any of them personally we might have corresponded with them some although probably very little there is a vast difference between seeing them on pictures like unto that, reading about their work, and actually going over there and meeting them and getting to know them. There's a difference. The point is that here are individuals who lived in the time of Christ, and some of them no doubt were there at the crucifixion, and could actually see Jesus being crucified. And they could hear with their own ears the words that he would speak while on the cross. And after he was raised from the dead, they could see him and touch him and feel him. And as much as we might, <clears throat> as much as we might try within our lives and within our minds to picture those things, there's that vast difference between being able to picture them and actually being there in the shadow of the cross and seeing them and experiencing them themselves. These individuals experience that. Now, we have to try to the very best of our ability within our mind to picture those things, to see them, to experience it through that which is written down for us, through the history that we can study as to the events that took place. But those individuals were there seeing the love of God demonstrated for them in Christ dying knowing that he had lived a sinless life, that he had done nothing worthy of death. And those individuals were there and they could experience liberality at, his, at its greatest. In Romans 5th chapter and verse 8, it says that God commended his love toward us and that, yet, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus had told us that greater love hath no man than this, that man lay down his life for his friends. And yet here we were at, his, at the point that we were enemies with him. We weren't friends even. And yet here he is the Son of God, laying down his life for us. A surpassing love and a surpassing liberality on God's part that certainly we find hard, we find difficult to even comprehend. There are individuals who bring out in their unbelief the idea of uh, how would a God allow his own son to die for someone else? And that becomes a stumbling block to their belief because they cannot fathom such great love that God demonstrated toward us. 
And yet here's these individuals in the shadow of the cross itself who can see that love demonstrated. They didn't have to just read about it. They saw it. They had proof. They were there engaged in the actions that were taking place. They had proof God gave. We are several centuries removed from, from that, those scenes. What we must do though within our mind is to make those events just as real for us as it was for them. But it's difficult. And thus, that feeling of liberality, many times, that they possess, that they had, does not carry over to us because it's just something, you know, we've heard it for centuries now. And growing up, we've heard it all of our lives. And we have become calloused to those feelings that we should have. There's no care and no concern many times because we, Christ died on the cross. Does that stir your emotions now? And every once in a while, we'll go into the details as to the, you know, the crucifixion and what it meant and what the body endured. And literally, it had people say, don't even want to hear it. They don't want to be touched with those feelings because we've separated ourselves from it. We need to feel that love that God possessed in the giving of his son. We need to feel the liberality, the generosity, the wonderful gift and grace that God demonstrated to us. And then it's going to have an effect upon our giving. How can a God who loved us to such an extent that he would give his only begotten son to suffer such a cruel, inhumane death so that you and I can be saved? And he entrusts to us, you and me, all that he has. And that message of salvation and how could it not affect us? And yet so many times we allow it not to. As the Father, as Christ was liberal in their love for us, that love should prompt us to action. John wrote in 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. We need to look at the love of God. And that will prompt us to love. And it will cause us to joyfully consecrate all that we have. And all that we are to our God. And yes, that will provoke within us a generosity, a liberality within our lives. And I'm going to do all for the service of God. I'm going to give, yes, of my time. I'm going to give of my energies, my efforts. And yes, I'm going to give of my money. Because God first loved us. 
And because he sent his son to die upon the cross for me. Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul recognized that individual nature of it. When he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. While he might have given himself for the whole world, and he did, Paul says, There is a personal aspect to it. He loved me. And if I was the only individual who ever lived upon the face of the earth, Christ would have come to this world and given himself and loved me to such an extent that he would have died for me. And that's true for each and every one of us. And he asked us then to live for him. To live for him, you must become a Christian, though. Thomas believed Christ because of the evidence that was given to him. Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. He had the evidence presented to him that Jesus was, had risen from the dead. And he says, my Lord and my God. We have the proper evidence that we need that Jesus was raised from the dead. And thus it should make us cry even as Thomas, my Lord and my God. That's belief. And then upon that. We repent of our sins. We turn away from that old life of sin to make Christ the Lord of our life. My Lord. He is my Lord. He's the master. He's the ruler. And so I turn from that old way of life to turn to him, to allow him to be the ruler of my life. Make a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ as God's son. And then I'm immersed in water to change that state from an unsaved state to a saved state. Where I now have that relationship with God and I live for him. Those sins that I have committed in the past, they're all washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ in that act of baptism. And so if you've not done that this morning, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. Or if you've become a Christian, but you haven't allowed Christ to truly to be Lord of your life. You haven't responded in that loving obedience to God because of God's great love for us. You realize your need this morning to come back and be faithful once again unto him. And we would encourage you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song.